So sign out and just give uh Yeah, like like, you know, uh I don't know. But battery <laughs> you know, officers, we don't do that stuff. Oh that's officers. right. You don't call you don't call folks <laughs> yeah, you call it Yeah, like, well yeah, we just call attention and hey, it's first sergeant. <laughs> There you go. They just to call you to attend and say first start to take charge or something like that. Exactly. <laughs> you know the deal. Yeah. No, I can definitely do that. Okay. So I just call them to attention and uh, give my farewell. Huh? <laughs> All right. I don't know what what size unit should I get. Anyway. Platoon, attention. First sergeant, take charge of the troops. I love it, sir. That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> you know, grow roots somewhere. And, but uh, yeah, I went to college. I was like, there's no way I'm going in the, into the army. I, you know, I, I, I want to, you know, at the time I, I was a big runner. So I was running in college and I was going, I wanted to be an engineer. And uh, so I took, you know, the first classes you had to take and <laughs> flunk calculus. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> No, nah, I'm not going to be an engineer. Uh, and then I was like, all right, I'll go with business. And I took uh, accounting. I was like, didn't do well in accounting. I'm like, man, I don't like accounting. <laughs> so then I was like, you know, this is like sophomore year. I'm like, oh, geez, what am I going to do? And uh, finally, you know, I had a friend who's like, hey, let's go down to the RTC department and talk to those folks. Marshall in the middle. <laughs> I can't see you quite yet. Okay, hopefully my video starts. Hopefully I'll start video. Here we go. There you are. Look at it. <laughs> All right. Ooh. Hey, that is so awesome. So <laughs> I'm riding down the road in the golf cart, and you text me just a minute ago, and you're like, Eastern or Central? And I'm like, oh, crap. Pull over, Bella. Pull over. Take me home. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. <laughs> Oh, because I'd already stood you up before we had issues. It didn't issues. stand me up. You know, technology these days doesn't cooperate sometimes. Oh, my gosh, sir. It's so great to see you. Yay. <laughs> it's good to see you, too, Will. You look good, man. What rank did you retire as? Oh, man, I made it to lieutenant colonel. They promoted me well well above what I was capable of doing. That is not true. <laughs> not true. Not true. You, sir, you were the funnest guy I ever worked for, ever. We had so much fun, right? Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah, we had, uh, you know, we kept those uh, lieutenants on their toes, didn't we? <laughs> it was just a pleasure. And, and you know, like, I don't, maybe it was just that time in my life. Maybe it was the time in my career where I'd accomplished at least enough that I felt like I could help somebody else. And you got this, you know, young, pliable, yeah. smart group of people that care. Yeah. And then you are our leader and you're just like, yeah, whatever. It's a great idea. I'll go do it. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> And that's what we did, right? Yeah. I mean, so it was, you know, it was a crazy time when we were there because, uh, you know, that was right around 2003 when the whole uh, Iraqi war started. And so, you know, everybody was like, oh, geez, you know, the way we're teaching things isn't really the way it should be done because uh, we hadn't really updated our doctrine that, that much to the way it should be. So we, we were flying by the seat of our pants on a lot of things. You know, but we adapted, and that's that's what the name of the game is. You know, yeah, it was it was it was fun though. I mean, we had a, a really good group of folks. You know, that were a fun. You know, that worked hard, but they enjoyed having a good time too, which it makes it it makes it enjoyable to serve in units like that. You know, yeah, it was good good stuff. Tell me yeah. about young Paul. You're you and I are about the same age. What? what yeah, I'm 50, 53. Yeah, me too. I was born so, yeah. in 68. Yeah, 67, November. So, yeah, I've got a, a birthday coming up here soon. But, yeah, young young Paul Riley, Army brat, you know, grew up in the Army. Uh, my dad, um, you know, was an officer. He was an air defense officer. So he, uh, you know, he, he rose through the ranks, and he, he did pretty well. He, he retired at two-star. And so, you know, when I uh, was young – 
I moved all over the country and I was like, man, this army stuff, I don't know about it. I don't like it. You know, it's, I wanted to stay in one place and I wanted to be, you know, grow roots somewhere. And, but uh, yeah, I went to college. I was like, there's no way I'm going in the, into the army. I, you know, I, I, I want to, oh, you know, at the time I, I was a big runner. So I was running in college and I was going, I wanted to be an engineer. And uh, so I took, you know, the first classes you had to take and <laughs> flunk calculus. <laughs> so I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to be an engineer. Uh, and then I was like, all right, I'll go with business. And I took uh, accounting. I was like, didn't do well in accounting. I'm like, man, I don't like accounting. <laughs> so then I was like, you know, this is like sophomore year. I'm like, oh, geez, what am I going to do? And uh, finally, you know, I had a friend who's like, hey, let's go down to the RTC department, talk to those folks. And uh, funny enough, one of the cadre down there, name of uh, Chris Moylan. And uh, Chris Moylan, you don't know Chris Moylan because he was the uh, battalion commander of uh, the unit we served with. So he was like, uh, he was a Captain Moylan at the time. And, and I talked to him and he's like, yeah, you know, come on, we got this thing, this camp down at Fort, uh, Fort Knox called Basic Camp. And you go down there and catch up, you know, and we can... You know, we could get you, uh, you know, into the program, contracted. And the funny thing about Chris Moylan, he uh, he was recruited into University of Rhode Island ROTC by my dad, who was the professor of military science at the time. <laughs> so, so it's kind of full circle, you know. He brought me into the program. My dad brought him into the program. But, uh, yeah, it just went from there, you know. I just... Uh, it, it went, uh, I went to basic camp, I went to advanced camp at Fort Bragg, I went to airborne school that same summer, and uh, yeah, I got contracted, and lo and behold, I went air defense, too, so it was, yeah, kind of a family affair thing. Was that, did you choose air defense? Did you, did I you did, it was my head? number one choice. Oh, that's awesome, it, right? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was, you know, so the, the thing that really turned it to me was advanced camp at Fort Bragg. We were out in the field and I woke up one morning, you know, and you had the FDXs, you had a, you know, you're, you were sucking it in the, in the woods there in the summer. It was hot. Bugs were just eating you alive. And I woke up one morning and I, and I had my, my lip was like the size of a softball. And I, and I was like, what the hell happened? He's like, ah, you know, I think it was uh, one of the uh, cadres like, ah, you probably got bit by a spider, you know, don't even go to the aid station. You'll be all right. It, it's cool. I'm like, and this sucks. I will never be infantry. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> I was like, what's the best, best thing? And, you know, they have the branch day. You get to go out, you know, visit all the different booths and everything. I was like, air defense, man, that looks, that looks high speed. It's still kind of combat armed, but but not really. You get to drive around in these neat vehicles. So that's what I was like, number one choice. And of course, you put it as your number one choice, you're going to get it. So yeah, it was, yeah. And then, um, so not only that, then I got Fort Riley as my first assignment. So then it was like, uh, and I thought it was a mistake. I'd never heard of Fort Riley before. I was like, I thought they had like made a mistake on my orders and put my last name as the fort. And I was like, hey, this is, and uh, Chris Moyna was like, you're saying, no, there's there's a real place called. <laughs> it's right in the middle of the United States, and uh, there ain't a whole lot around it. <laughs> and it's flat, and it's really hot during the summer, and it's really cold. <laughs> and he was right. It was, but it was an awesome, awesome first assignment. Yeah, good. It was Vulcan Stinger. It was a Vulcan Stinger unit. And, uh, goodness gracious, that was. Tell, tell me about, uh, like, integration as a young, you know. Oh, I, you know. And, well, I got to interrupt, though. Like, you got to you gotta know that somebody in your unit knew that you were General Riley's son. You know, I try to keep it under wraps because I didn't want to, you know, everybody has their preconceived notions, and probably somebody got a butt chewing by my dad sometime in their career. So I didn't announce it, but the uh, battalion commander at the time was Clifford Willis. And, uh, and he knew. And, and so, 
Yeah, and by that time, you know, I'd gone through OBC and, and word had followed, you know, this is, you know, General Riley's kid showing up at the unit. And I didn't want, I didn't any, want any part of that. You know, I wanted to make my own name, but it's really hard. I mean, cause it's like, you know, he's an air defender. I'm an air defender now too. But uh, yeah, it, it, it worked out. You know, I mean, I wasn't the best lieutenant. I'll tell you that straight up. I mean, I was, you know, I didn't take it very seriously to begin with. Uh, I'm, you know, as you, you've already pointed out, you know, I, I like to have a good time. I, I have a good sense of humor yeah, and I like to, I like to joke around. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and Clifford Willis was not one of those guys that liked to joke, liked to joke around. And my battery commander was uh, Ricky Hooker. He's six seven black guy. He was the, one of the funniest men I've ever met. Uh, college basketball player, but he uh, he was serious, very serious guy, and I was not serious. But he had, like I said, he had a good sense of humor. And one of the best butt chewings I ever got from Ricky Hooker was, you know, he asked me to update the uh, recall roster for my platoon, and. Uh, some reason I didn't do it and the next morning like he, he looked he brought me in his office you know made me stand at attention at his desk and he's like lieutenant I told you to update your recall roster why didn't you do it last night and I said well well sir I you know I I, I just didn't have the time you know I, I you know I, whatever I gave him a horrible reason and he, he looked me straight in the eye and he goes lieutenant did you sleep last night and I said, well, yes, I did, sir. He goes, well, then you had the time, Lieutenant. <laughs> I was, and that was like, you know, I had never experienced that before. He just, he blew my mind that like, oh my God, this is, this is the real deal. You know, you sleep, you mean I'm not supposed to sleep. <laughs> so it was a rude awakening. And yeah, it was a lot. Like I said, I was not a very good lieutenant. I had awesome NCOs that squared me away and got me up to speed very quickly. Do you ever remember being pulled aside today, sir? Whoa. Oh, my God. Yeah, all the time. Like, uh, like uh, my platoon sergeant, his name was Billy Ocean. I, I ain't kidding you. Billy Ocean, like, you know, the singer, Caribbean queen, you know. And he was a uh, Baptist minister on the side. And he, uh, he was great. I mean, he was the most patient person I ever had. You want to talk about old, crusty squad leaders? I had the crustiest squad leaders. Like, I had dudes that were 17 years in the Army, E6s, that were like Vietnam vets, you know, that were just crazy <laughs> dudes that... that that knew everything like they they were squared away and they were crusty and they they had seen a million lieutenants come through that platoon you know and they were just like oh god here's another one we got to train up you know <laughs> it's like we're gonna <laughs> and so they're like you know they were they were super you know they were just so patient and so you know uh they, they squared me away let's just say that they they taught me the way a lieutenant should act and what they should know and it was yeah it was the best assignment i've never asked an officer this before but i'm going to ask you if you don't mind do you have a lost lieutenant story oh absolutely i got <laughs> i got probably one of the more classic lost you know the the term was lid lid lost in the desert lid and uh man it was so it was during operation desert storm i'm a platoon leader and uh, it's uh, one of the more famous battles there, the Battle of Norfolk. And I'm a Vulcan platoon leader. And so during the night, air defense dudes don't do a whole lot. You know, we, there's, not a, there's not a big air threat, you know, so we're really following and keeping up with the Bradleys and the, the tanks. And so at some point, I think we got, our, our convoys got crossed and I ended up following another unit um, and I, and so I followed, and it was a good three hours. We followed this unit and by daybreak, you know, my, 
my uh, <laughs> my senior squad leader is like, hey, sir, we're we're in the wrong unit right now. <laughs> you realize you're looking at the, the the markings on the vehicles and they're like, hey, man, this is this is not the task force we are supporting. I'm like, oh, my God. So, you know, and so like I'm looking around and it's just desert, you know, miles of desert. And you'll see a cluster of vehicles over here about five miles and about another one over five miles over there. You're like and you're on the radio trying to get it. You know, your radios don't work. Um, so finally I was like, well, we're just going to pick a unit. So I started, you know, we drive over to one, Hey, what unit is this? Oh, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is three, six, six, Charlie, company. I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> to another unit. We did that for a good two, three hours. Finally, we linked up with my unit. And, uh, you know, so I, when we, when we'd get to a unit, my crustiest squad leader was like, uh, you know, we, we talked to the unit that it wasn't our unit. He looks right at me with like the utter face of frustration. He's like, Lieutenant, what are we going to do now? <laughs> I was like, We're just going to keep on traveling. Like, it was so bad. You know what I mean? As Lieutenant, that's the, that, I mean, you are like the, the guy, you know, the poster child for the, you know, the lost Lieutenant. And, uh, it, it was horrible, but, and, and not only that, you know, I mean, there was no sleep involved. We, we you know, it was a hundred hours of just, you know, going someplace one after the next. And I mean, it, it was a learning experience. Like I'm thank God, no, none of, nobody in my platoon got hurt. You know, you know, we, we did take fire and, you know, we did have some trying times, but thank God nobody got hurt or killed in my platoon because uh, that was my, you know, I've, that wasn't a huge war for air defenders. You know, we didn't fire on any aircraft, really. We were mostly ground support mode. Uh, but thank God, like, my platoon, that was my main goal during the whole time is bring my guys home safe. Uh, yeah, so it was... Uh, the lost lieutenant, that was me. Yep. <laughs> I, knew, I knew I was going to be laughing the whole time. Oh, yeah. It was, it was bad, man. It was bad. I just knew we were. So, I mean, you know, tell me about young Paul. You know, were you good in school and stuff? I was, you know, I, 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 I studied when I needed to. I, I, you know, I passed tests when I needed to. Um but I didn't, you know, I, was, I, I just didn't, uh, I wasn't, you know, the thing I was passionate about was running. I loved running. Um, and I was track cross country in high school. Um, I, you know, I was going to be a world-class runner. I was going to go to the Olympics. Nike was going to endorse me, you know, and pay me huge money to, to pay, you know, to run at all. <laughs> and uh, that just didn't work, you know, it didn't work out that way. It's, I got to college. And I was like, man, I, I am like I'm the low man on the totem pole here. <laughs> I wasn't that good, you know. I thought I was good, but yeah. So I just, uh, I just had to do some soul searching. You know, what am I going to do with my life? I, I was good at school, you know. I could, you know, um, but I just wasn't passionate about any of the subjects that I was going, you know, I was taking, and uh, the subjects I was passionate about, like you know anthropology what the heck are you going to do with an anthropology degree you know <laughs> so it's just that like you know I, I'd been around the army my whole life and I was like well you know and I said I don't want to do this well let me check it out let me just give it a try and see you know and like I said I went to basic camp and I loved it and uh it was like man something lit up on me I was like man this is great you know I, I love being around the people and doing I'm a, a physically active person I love all the running and the cadence. I love cadence calling. And um, yeah, it just, it, was, it just really, you know, hit me somewhere where it was like, okay, this is something I could do. Um, but still, I was only going to do it for four years. I wasn't going to do it for 20. You know, I was, uh, I was a guy that was like four, get some experience, write that, you know, build up that resume. And then, then I get to, you know, get a real job. Uh, make big bucks in the outside world, you know, and uh, that is just, 
24 years later, it was like, <laughs> where did the time go? Right. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about uh, tell me about going to jump school and jumping out of airplanes Man. and being a paratrooper. I, I mean, loved that's a it. Big thing, right? I loved it. Yeah, and and so I was hoping I'd get assigned to an airborne unit out of college, but uh, it just didn't happen. But yeah, I just so I, I was kind of strange. I went to airborne school, and then I um went to advanced camp after it. So everybody's like, "Oh, stupid! You're going to get injured, and then you won't be able to do advanced camp." And then you know, I was like. I'm not going to get hurt. <laughs> That's what are you talking about? But of course, on one of my jumps, uh, I landed funny and I tweaked my calf. And of course, you know, those they, they made you run uh, from the drop zone up to, uh, geez, it was a couple mile run at least, uh, just to see who was injured, you know, and who, you know, if somebody was struggling and couldn't keep up, then they're like, hey, you're going to be a recycle. <laughs> I was like, so, man, I was doing the Quasimodo, you know, but I was not going to, I was not going to get recycled. Yeah, I was just like, there's no way they're going to get me out of this. But I loved it, man. I loved, uh, I loved jumping out. So I was at a, the main reason I did it, because I was a scared, I was scared of heights. Uh, and I was like, oh, shoot, I got to conquer this fear. You know, I got to do something to, to overcome it. So one of the jumps. They uh, they had me stand in the door. It was a C-130, and man, I was standing there, you know, the whole <laughs> looking at everything go by, and I was, you know, fucker factor was. I was like, oh my god, this is the real deal. <laughs> and then they, yeah, they said go jump out, and I always had horrible, horrible exits. Like my risers would be twisted. I'd be doing, you know, the bicycle and pulling in. You know, it would finally come clear, like right before I was supposed to land. And then so I'd be trying to, you know, which way am I going? Where, how, which risers do I have to pull down? And I, was, I just wipe out on the drop. So <laughs> it would always be feet, butt, head <laughs> for my landing. <laughs> yeah. But I loved Airborne. Yeah, it was, it was a good time. But that's the last time I ever did it, you know? It's, um, <clears throat> you know, it, Look, a lot of people, a lot of people will say crazy things about people that are like five jump chumps. Okay, Here, but here's my take on it, all of it. Okay, the willingness to jump out of an airplane shows, but uh, what you're willing to do because the army tells you what to do, right? I'm yeah. not a Medal of Honor winner, not because I wasn't willing to go charge the machine gun nest. You know, maybe yeah. I would have. I might have cowered in danger with the rest of us. I don't know. <laughs> but I jumped out of a plane, and you yeah. Know, it, does, it shows your commitment, right? Yeah, You're Gavin, committed. Gavin says, show me a man who will jump, and I'll show you a man who will fight. And, uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, so tell me about your first, you know, you, were, you, were, you, you, you went to a unit, and you're deployed to the Gulf War, and it was a Vulcan Stinger unit, you yeah. know. Tell me, tell me about when you realized you were the adult in the room. <laughs> Remember a time when you had to be the adult? All of a sudden, you were the commander, or you were the something. Yeah, I mean, so right off the bat, you know. So I showed up at my unit in November of of uh, geez ninety. So, well, no, not ninety. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm getting all my dates all messed up. But I basically November. Um, yeah, in November of 90, I showed up. And then so the unit got uh, notified that they were deploying to the Desert Storm. And they were, we were gone in January. And then, you know, of course, 82nd was there holding the line in Saudi Arabia. And, um, you know, the, I, I hadn't ridden in. So when I was at OBC, we really didn't get to work on our vehicles at all because they used, they yanked all of them and used them as, you know, de forward deployed them so that they could be spares for everybody else. So I didn't, I didn't really get to work on the weapon system a whole lot. Um, so the first time I actually rode in my vehicle was down to the railhead to load it onto the train to ship it overseas. <laughs> so I'm like <laughs> trying to figure out radios and I mean, it was, it was pucker factor time, you know, and, uh, yeah, so it was it was learning on the fly, a lot of things. And that was like, you know, they're 
they're constantly, as a lieutenant, you know, they're constantly giving you directions and guidance and you need to do this. And it's just a, it's a tidal wave of responsibility. You know, you've got to make sure your vehicles are packed right. You've got to have the hazardous placards and it's got to be this way, packed exactly like this. You know, you got an inspector coming this time. If you fail, you're going to be here till midnight. <laughs> You know, you've got zero time for yourself. And yeah, I mean, it's just all those responsibilities. Just, you know, you realize very quickly, like, hey, this is, but like me, I was a big goofball too. You know, so I tried to make the best. I knew there was serious stress in the unit. And I knew everybody was like, really, like, hey, this is a real deal. We're going to go to war. You know, I was kind of a goofball too, though, and I wanted to make sure, and that's, yeah, I used humor to, to really lighten up the, the, the mood with the fellas, because you know, stress is not a good thing, <laughs> and uh, too much stress is really not a good thing, so you got to lighten the, and as a, as a leader, you know, you've got to, you've got to project that, hey, this is not a big deal, we're going to get through this, and, you know, show that confidence that, you know, you can, you can handle the stress. So, yeah, that, that was my thing. You know, I wanted to make sure that the guys were, had confidence in me. And even though I was a goofball, they, they understood that I knew my job, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Did you have somebody that, that, that you like looked up to that, that taught you a lot? Uh, yeah. Your job early on? Yeah. So, you know, Ricky Hooker, Captain Ricky Hooker was a, a great mentor. My fellow platoon leaders. I already talked about my, you know, NCOs, but uh, one in particular, um, um, Mike Morrissey, who's Major General Mike Morrissey now, uh, he was, you know, we went to, through OBC together, we went to Fort Riley together, we deployed together, so we, you know, he's my roommate when I, when I moved out there, um, so we confided a lot in each other, and he was squared away, you know, as a lieutenant, he was, he was squared away, you know, to the nine. So, yeah, I mean, I, I leaned on him a lot for expertise on things, um, you know, confide to, hey, you know, run ideas by him. I mean, that's a perfect way to, to really, you know, learn and, and grow is your peers. I mean, that's where you can get great ideas for, for leadership and how to do things. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I had some great ones, um, you know, my whole, you know, my fellow platoon leaders in my, in my battery were, were great. I mean, they all went on and, you know, Rob Rickmeyer, Rob Staten, um, these are guys, you know, that, that I'll, I'll remember the rest of my life because they're just, you know, quality folks, will, and team players, weren't in it for themselves, um, you know, wanted everybody to succeed. They were, they were super folks, yeah. It, uh, look. I think you and I obviously had a very similar experience at every level in every unit. I was surrounded by American warrior heroes, good people that wanted to do the right thing at every level. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's not to say there aren't bad ones too. And you learn from the bad ones as well. And I've had some bad leaders, um, senior leaders that, that, you know, they, they, you know, ran the unit more like a mafia than they did, you know, an army organization. So, um, but the vast majority of the leaders I've served with were very good and, you know, cared about people, uh, which is what it's all about. I mean, that's why, you know, that's why I admire what you're doing right now. I mean, you know, they say every soldier has a story and um, you're, you're helping with that. You know, you're helping soldiers share their story because a lot of soldiers don't want to share their story because um, it's too painful or it's you know a, a part of their life where they don't think people appreciate it or they don't want you know to recognize it so what you're doing is, is you know super it's it's like so admirable and honorable and uh one of the main you know i love watching your videos because when you're watching you know number one you're you're a really personable guy. I mean, you can bring out, you know, soldiers love talking to you because you, you know, they just, you make them feel good, which is good. <laughs> so, but I mean, I love watching your videos because 
as I'm listening to the dialogue between you and whoever you're interviewing, it's stirring thoughts in my head, like, oh, I remember stuff like that. And it's like, it brings back all these emotions and it's just, it's positive. You know, it's all so positive, which um, hats off to you, man. It, it, it's great what you're doing. Well, thank you, sir. Tell me a little bit about the black boot pressed BDU army. Do you remember <laughs> that? Oh, oh man, do I remember it. So I was not the shiny boots kind of guy, you know. I was the Hershey bar guy. So <laughs> I hated I not till later did I, you know, start starching my BDUs and really spit shining my boots and blousing, you know, using blousing uh bands on my leg, my pant legs, you know, and I mean those <laughs> Those days are over, right? I mean, soldiers don't have to do it. They, they've got suede boots now. <laughs> you don't have to shine suede. <laughs> uh, but yeah, those are different times, man. I remember you get, you know, you get off work, it's late, and you get, you gotta you gotta shine your boots. And it takes it, it's not quick. You know, spit shining boots takes a good hour if you're good. Cause and it takes, you know, I got rigor mortis, I got, you know. Carpal tunnel issues with my, with my from doing all that. Yeah, kiwi. You know, I I I spent a lot of money with kiwi. Yeah, but yeah, those, you know, those were uh, different times. You know, you didn't. You know, you don't start uniforms anymore. Um, yeah, it's. it's Hey, it was, if it looks good and it feels good, it is good. And yeah, I mean, you remember at every level. Remember stepping into that uniform the first time after you starched it? It was like, <laughs> <laughs> and you could, you know, you could get a paper cut on the crease on your pants if you slid your finger down it. You know, that those was a good day. <laughs> I just get goosebumps even thinking about making starch again, right? Yeah, and, and the good wool, with the like good when you wool sock on it. Oh, when you when you when they uh, when you sweat it in them and it stunk, like it, the the sweat with the starch would it would be like, oh, what is that? <laughs> oh, yeah. great times, great times. So tell me about, you know, the next step after the Gulf War. I mean, at some point comes Battery Command, Advanced Corps. Yeah. Things. Tell me tell me about, I see that see that guide on behind you there. Yeah, 652. Yeah. So, yeah, so I was, uh, I was like I said, I was a different guy. Uh, so I was Shorad to start off with. And then I saw the writing on the wall where Shorad was going to start going away. And, and so I was like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm only serving for you know four years. Well, and then I got the advanced course. And I was like, well, maybe I, I want to do battery command, just battery command. I want to check it out, see how I do, and then I'll make a decision after that. So I went over to the high mad side. So I, you know, big joke was I'm shy mad now, short red and high mad, shy mad. So yeah, I get I get a you know I go to advanced course. I, I'm a mentor for like one one little brief period there. Uh, and then they sent me over to Germany and I am clueless again. I'm like a brand new lieutenant because I got no idea about Patriot. Um, the, I'm a battle captain in the talk at, at 652 and they're thrown around and it's Germany. So this is the big, you know, Mike and Delta plan, NATO Cacabal, you know, and they're throwing around terms that I'm like, hey, I, you know, I can take a hill, you know, <laughs> and you're talking about air corridors and minimum altitudes. And I was like, whoa, I got to, so this, this is the hundred pound, hundred pound brain folks, you know, that have to fight in a van now, um, instead of, you know, shooting bullets down range and that kind of, uh, so it was a big, it was a big change. Um, and it wasn't something that came easy either. I mean, it, I was a, uh, battle captain for about 18 months uh, and waiting for a command and waiting for the chance, you know, that I could prove that, you know, I could, I could also do this stuff. And it was, uh, yeah, it was a hard transition, but I mean, once I got it done, it was, it was great. Um, 
I had a I had a unit I a battery we we deployed uh, twice to Kuwait when Saddam Hussein was acting the fool, you know, when he was rattling his saber, and so they'd be like, oh, okay, Patriot, you got to go back over, <laughs> and then you come back. All right, he's doing it again. Go back. It's, uh, I mean, those were the years where people were deploying all the time for like these six month rotations to to Saudi. So yeah, we did that, and then um, and then in the midst of all that, we had a NATO tack eval too. We had to do, which is a huge train up, and it's a big deal because you know the uh, Germans are evaluating you, and the the Dutch, and you know they're they're. You know, they're, they're no joke. These guys are tough evaluators and it's, it was hard. So but yeah, it's fun. I mean, you know, going, we were in the field a lot. Um, when it was over, it was like joyous, you know, the heavens opened up and sang. It was like, thank God that's over. Cause it was just so much time and effort and stress. And um, yeah, it, it, but it was, you know, the unit did great. And that's, that's what I could always count on is like, you know, just tell soldiers what to do. Uh, tell them the standard and say, Hey, that's the standard. Let's go meet it. If we don't, if we don't uh, meet the standard, we'll retrain, we'll get, we'll get back up to speed and then we'll try it again. And that's all we did. I mean, it's very simple. You know, army stuff is not really difficult. It's, it's written down. You've got guys that have done it before 99% of the time. They know what the standard is and they, they can teach everybody else. Um, and so you, if you enable your folks, man, they're like one of my proudest moments as a battery commander was, you know, on a Patriot battery site, you have to do your own protection. You have your own QRF. And usually it's the launcher dogs, you know, that, uh, that provide like if there's a threat at you know one of your bunkers they can the qrf can run out there and and so during the evaluation the nato tack about there was a <laughs> there was a uh, a threat at, our, at one of our bunkers we we like over the loudspeaker i think qrf deployed to so and so and i saw these guys just running full speed like doing bounding overwatch and like, uh, it was so impressive. I was like, oh my God. Like, it's one of those proud parent moments. You know, you're like, we trained to do this and they did it because, and the evaluators were just like, wow, this is awesome. I mean, they were popping, this was at night. So they were popping off flares to illuminate the area. And they were like, just doing everything right. And it was like, wow, this is super, you know, this is like exactly how it should be done and how you, you know, you envisioned it. And, it came, you know, they executed it. It was like, it, it, you can't ask for more than that as a leader. You know, you're like, oh, this is, this is, this is heaven. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I enjoyed most about my time as a Patriot First Sergeant was the fact that we all fought together. Much like a Vulcan platoon leader fights with your platoon, the, you know, a battery of Patriot fights together. So you all deploy together and you're right there all around each other and you're talking on your little radios and you can point to each other and you know, it's- Yeah, you're all right there. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I mean, and so, you know, there's always those rivalries, you know, you've got the fire control platoon and the launcher platoon and the maintenance platoon and they're all, I mean, there's always a little struggle amongst them, but uh, I mean, so, you know, your job is, is to be a cohesive team, you know, and, and work together. And there, there's always pointing fingers, you know, like, oh, they can't get the launchers in place at the high. And you're just the guy that's like, hey, wait a second, you know, we got a, we, you know, we got a mission, we got a, and you're, you're, you know, you and the first SARS and, and the platoon SARS and the platoon leaders, yeah, I mean, it was, it's leadership is leadership, you know, I mean, you're just, you know, focus on the mission, but yeah, it's, 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 it was fun. Do you remember like one time when you had to like give somebody an article 15 or do oh. some kind of a punishment to somebody that had messed up or something? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, the old adage, you know, you spend 80% of your time on 20% of your knuckleheads and that that's true. I mean, you know, it's 
especially in Germany. I mean, it was, it was a lot of field time. Um, so when soldiers get back to garrison, you know, they're like, hey, I'm going I'm to go out and have a good time, you know. And they do dumb things, you know, a lot of DUIs and, and stuff like that. But um, I mean, you know, that was a part of, of uh, battery command that I didn't enjoy. I mean, I didn't, I didn't enjoy punishing soldiers for things that they did. I was probably one of the more lenient battery commanders because I wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt a lot of the time. Uh, but some things are just cut and dry. You know, and, and your hands are tied on what you can do. I mean, there's, you know, you've got, it's always the, you know, you've got a soldier who's super at their job. Like they can, they, they know exactly what to do. They're very good at it, but they, you know, <laughs> they have a, you know, well, some of them are alcoholics, you know, and some of them just like to drink too much. And so how do you balance that? You know, you want to get the kid help, you know, is but he's so good at his job, um, you know, how do you balance that as a leader? <laughs> Isn't it right? I mean, it's, it's hard. Hey, look. Well, you don't have to worry about that, right? I had a situation, <laughs> I had a situation where, like, I knew, I just knew, I just knew if I was to have given a urinalysis to this person that randomly came up, that I would have a table 12 crew that would be knocked out. Okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you are, no, I no, you're not. We're not having your analysis today, sir. We're not. No. <laughs> we're, maybe next week. You do it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> man. Uh, oh, your analysis. I hated those. I still uh, got to do them for my current job. But... So there's one your analysis story I have. Okay. I was I was in Hawaii. I was uh, signed 94th, and so Jack Johnson. I don't know if you know Jack Johnson. He's a singer, pretty laid back, but his his fans are known for for smoking dope. They they like the marijuana. Went to his concert, man. Just everybody around me just smoking. Dope. I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna get like secondhand. I'm gonna get. <laughs> And wouldn't you know it, the next morning, your analysis. I'm like, I'm dead. I'm gone. I'm gonna, they're going to kick me out of the army. And so I go, I go to my boss. I'm like, hey, sir, I was at the concert last night. There were people smoking dope all over. That. I'm positive I'm going to come up hot on this year analysis. He's like, secondhand smoke? Nah, don't worry about it. They've done studies about it. And, you know, it, it won't come up. I'm like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. Sure enough, I didn't come up hot. I was like, oh, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. We we lived under a constant state of worry. You know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I never did that stuff, but I was like, but you're right, though. You know, you got your team. T you know, table twelve. It, t it takes a long time, a lot of effort, a lot of training to get a team built up for that. And, to have one of those folks, it goes down to table zero. <laughs> you you got to start all over again. Yeah. Oh. oh, great times, great times. So, you know, tell me more. At some point, you end up working with me there. Yeah, uh, so after. Lieutenants and captains. Yeah, and after battery command, I was, uh, so they wanted me to go off into ROTC and teach. So I actually went back to my alma mater at University of Rhode Island, did uh assistant uh, professor of military science um, at Providence College and University of Rhode Island. Uh, did that for three years. Great time teaching cadets how to be lieutenants. Um, you know, the whole leadership thing again. And then after that job, it was like, okay, I've got to get S3 time now. You know, I got to be an S3 somewhere. So Chris Moylan, contacts me and say, hey, why don't you come work for the schoolhouse, be uh, the OVC commander. <laughs> I'm like, OVC commander, what the heck do they do? And it's a major's position. I was like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll go do it. And I took over from Beaver Hugh. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, like I said before, it was super quality people. You know, and the great thing about OVC is you have, you know, a captain and a senior NCO who teach these lieutenants, you know, how to do things right. And I, you know, one of the few 
branches that does that. You know, I have NCOs um, that that teach lieutenants. You know, brand new OBC lieutenants and uh, man, you and Burnley and uh, man, who else? Canada, Maxwell. Yeah, um, yeah Maxwell and um, Gar Garcia, right? He was the first sergeant for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a good time, man. I mean, <laughs> I'll never. So this is a story with you. Organization day. Um, you had this game that you like to play with the football. It's like basically it was throw the football at each other as fast as you can, and whoever drops it loses. And I played that game with you, and that was that was heated a heated game. <laughs> And it's scary. Well, yeah, if somebody's got a good throwing arm with a football, they can, and you're only 10 feet of, you know, 10, 15 feet away from each other, throwing the ball as hard as you can. <laughs> and if it's in your area, you got to catch it. If you drop it, you lose. And uh, you won, you beat me, but <laughs> we had a good, <laughs> we had a good, you know, battle going back and forth. Of course, everybody's gathering around looking. And I mean, that's another great thing about the, the army, you know, I mean, just, Competition is promoted and encouraged, and and it's great. You know, it brings people together. And after that, you know, it was like, yeah, oh, good, yeah, everybody is laughing about it, and it was it was a good time. You know, that's great. Uh, so that's a game that we played when I was a black cat. When I was a jump master instructor, we would put the students on break and then go inside the classroom. <laughs> and throw the football as hard as we could at each other. Sometimes we'd knock plaques off the wall and everything. I can imagine. <laughs> but that so I so I had a little advantage on you because I had done it for you know about a couple of years. You know? Yeah, that's a good game. Oh, I can't play it with my daughters though. <laughs> oh, no. oh, they don't no. like it. <laughs> no, 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 no. So tell so tell me about you know who prays for you when they lay their their head on the pillow at night. Oh, tell me about man. your daughters and I, I I see some of your Facebook posts and stuff. Tell me you know you're a loving wonderful person. Tell me more about those that love you. Yeah, so of course my wife you know loves me. My daughters you know they're all adults now. You know they're all graduated and uh, most of them have jobs. <laughs> Looking for jobs now, but you know they um. They were very supportive of me, you know, and, um, you know, even though you have, you know, an army, you're not there all the time. And, and one of my biggest regrets in the army was um, my oldest daughter. I moved her after her junior year of high school to he, this area. And so she had to do her senior year in a high school that she never, you know, didn't know anybody. And so as a parent, you know, you're like, oh, that's, that's, that's hard you know you're putting a lot of stress on your kids uh but they they were always so supportive and um just troopers you know and, and you like to think that it made them tough and you know it got them ready for the, the cold cruel world uh but i think you know they're doing okay and in my you know my my brothers and sisters and sister and my mom um yeah i mean my family is you know very supportive they're all you know my brother my oldest brother is a retired well so he was in the army got kicked out um joined the coast guard became rescue diver and then um he developed a uh, bacterial infection and lost all his limbs uh, so he had a very difficult time. He's, he's one of my personal heroes. I mean, he, he's not just my brother, but he's, he's an amazing guy. Um, you know, imagine the, you know, him having to relearn everything basically, uh, and his wife, you know, and his children having to support him, but he's, um, just an amazing guy. And he, so he's, uh, he became the national commander for the DAV, the Disabled American Veterans. And so he goes to all, visits all the different hospitals and helps vets and goes on trips. And, you know, the, you know the, he, he's been there and done that. And so when a disabled vet sees him, they're like, well, shoot, this guy can do it. So I, I, guy doesn't have any arms or legs. And he's walking around 
just like you and me. And um, so he, you know, he's an inspiration. My other brother was in the army for 28, uh, Army National Guard for 28 years. He lives up in Alaska. My sister is a teacher in, in Texas. Um, and uh, yeah, so just a lot of, you know, we've all been around the army forever. And of course, my dad, you know, who passed two years ago, but, um, you know, he was always just so supportive of me and uh, proud of me, you know, that I, that I, I did what I did. So, yeah, it was, it was all good. So, I mean, I, I mean, we, I've asked a little bit about it before, but I'm going to ask you again, what, what was it like to grow up as the general's son? You know? Yeah. That's, that's a, right? So it, it you think it's all, uh, you know, parades and picnics and um, not so much, you know, as a, as a kid, because, um, you know, I, uh, my brother's experiences are very different than mine. So my brothers moved out of the house when my dad was a Lieutenant Colonel. And so, and I grew up, you know, my high school years was when he was like the DCG of Fort Bliss. And so we lived in the Pershing house and, you know, it was really nice, but I never saw him. I mean, he was always traveling, always busy, always doing things. Um, so it was like, yeah, okay. It's, you know, he's an important guy. He's got an important mission to do. So, um, but, you know, as, as far as a father, he wasn't really there. I mean, he'd come, you know, he'd come back and we'd talk and stuff, but, uh, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult when, you know, if somebody's in that position, there's a lot of responsibility on them. So, um, yeah, and, and he, he was just, he was gone a lot. Can I ask you a question? Huh? Is there a secret ADA, like, father-son password or something? <laughs> huh? yeah. Obviously, I didn't learn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, but you know what? There are... Just imagine showing up to a unit and saying, ah, you're Lieutenant Riley. You're uh, General Riley's boy. I mean, imagine the stress and the, you know, the expectations that are put on you in, in that position. So it's, it's, it's a lot of pressure, but, you know, like I said, I was a goofball. I, and plus, I didn't really, you know, I didn't take it too seriously. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you, you do get to see, you know, the Oz behind the curtain a little bit growing right. up in the army and, and seeing how fake people can be, right. how they, how they try to brown nose and suck up. And so I, I was able to spot that very quickly with people, uh, people that were trying to use me to get to my dad, you know, stuff like that. It's like, you know, that's, that's squirrely. So okay. like, uh, yeah, I didn't, I, I could, I could be, I could recognize a BSer pretty quickly. I'll and, never forget when uh, uh, a Lieutenant showed up at our course, right? His name was, last name was Seward. And <laughs> uh, he said, yeah, Uncle John, right? Made a comment about like that offhand. Yeah. Uh, about General Seward. And we are all, you know, all of us instructors, we were all scrambling. They're like, oh, is that General, you know, whatever. Turned out, of course, not. He was <laughs> no yellow guy. You know, so we were also the lucky ones that had, I don't know if you know, um, I don't know if you remember this kid, but uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Do you remember that name? So she's a famous presidential historian in the United States, very well known, uh, very credited. I mean, just in the history area, she's like very high up there. Her son went to our OBC. And so I admire him because he kept it close hold for up until graduation because she was going to come to graduation. And he, so he came to me, he's like, sir, I, I know, you know, I, I haven't been up front with you but I need to let you know that my mother's going to be coming. And I'm, you know, I'm like, all right, so she's got to be a Senator or, you know, Congress or something like that. No. And so he said, yeah, my mom, Doris Kearns Goodwin is coming to the graduation and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, 
who who's that? <laughs> I have no idea who she was. And he's like, oh, you know, she's kind of a big deal. She taught it like I don't know, she taught it like Harvard or or something. But I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> I was like, whatever. I, you know, we'll deal with it. All right, thanks for telling me. Bye. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was all good after that. And of course, everybody else was freaking out. You know, um, you know, Colonel Moylan and and uh, Colonel Hamilton. And uh, oh, geez, who's the eighty? I don't know. I can't remember. But uh, I mean, everybody else was like pucker back. Oh man, this is this is an important person. We got to make a good impression. You know that kind of thing. But, hey, the air defenders. We were good at putting on shows. Weren't oh, we? we put on some good graduations. Yeah. Oh. Do you remember uh, Medal of Honor recipient uh, Colonel Millet? Yes. That was a good one. Yes. And uh, he had people crying in the audience because. You know, his son was killed in Vietnam, and uh, he wrote a poem and read it at that graduation, and it was powerful. It was a really good, um, but yeah, just we've had, we had some good ones. So, what was the next step after that for you? What did you? So then, you... Uh, so then after that, I I, uh, I was like, okay, I got to figure out what to do after S three. Um, so then I went to uh, Hawaii. To the 94th AAMDC, and uh, that was General Seward was the first CG of the 94th. And guess who was the G3? Chris Moylan. <laughs> so, you know, he is he had already gone out there, and he was like, "Hey, I need a I need an assistant, uh, you know, G3 dude." I was like, "Yeah, Hawaii sold, of course." <laughs> So yeah, I went to we went to Hawaii, served there a couple of years, and then um, and then it was like, uh, well, what to do? So you know, I was getting around that point where it's like, okay, uh, got to figure out battalion command, or am I going to get selected, or if not? But what I really wanted to do is I wanted to be a professor of military science at a college. That's that's like you know that was my dream job. So I put my packet in when I was in Hawaii and they said, okay, yeah, let's, uh, they, they find, they selected me and they said, okay, uh, available schools, Temple University. And I'm like, Temple University. Okay. I went to the University of Rhode Island. Temple was one of their rivals. I knew it was in Philadelphia, but I'd never been to Philadelphia, but in the East coast, kind of close to home and getting back that way. All right, cool. I'll, I'll go there. So uh, first day driving into the office and I'm driving through North Philly and, and I'm, I'm like, oh my God, it looked like Bosnia. It looked like, a, you know, church steeples were blown up on the sidewalk and it was run down. I was like, oh my God, what did I, this place looks like, you know, I'm going to get mugged at any point. And then I drove a couple more blocks and boom, it opened up and it was Temple's campus and it was like beautiful. I was like, wow, that, what a what a change. So they, you know, they they're briefing me on, you know, the the campus and everything. And they're like, yeah, Temple University has the fourth largest police force in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm like, Temple? The just the, the school. <laughs> I mean, we're talking like there's some major cities in, in books Pittsburgh, there. Books you know. There. I was like, wow. So um it was it was a different experience, you know, dealing with a college and administrators and teachers, you know, and professors. It was it was very different than the you know what you have to do in in a normal unit. You know, you're more you're an advocate for you know for making leaders for our army and a lot of you know. A lot of, I mean, a lot of the experiences I had were very positive with my job, but there were some negative ones. You know, when you'd have a table at an event, and you're trying to recruit, you know, you'd have people coming up to you and saying, well, how can you justify, you know, killing babies and blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, you have those people that just do not like what you do. And I mean, you just have to, you know, drive on and try to tell your story and you know, the big thing was don't ask, don't tell. Um, they really despised the policy and they're saying, hey, you know, 
I, I understand your point of view, but I don't make laws. You know, I follow laws. And right now that's the law. So I can't, you know, do I agree or disagree with it? It doesn't matter. I follow, I follow the, you know, the regulations that are given to me. So of course that doesn't, that's not good enough. <laughs> that's not a good enough answer for <laughs> So there's there's something comforting about that as a soldier, right? You just follow you just follow orders. You know, yeah. you stand here, wear this uniform, and point your gun in this direction. <laughs> and if somebody attacks you, you just shoot them back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is it is, and that that was the easy part of the job. You know, the easy part was, hey, we're making leaders. You're doing, we're teaching you, we're bringing you out on the land now, so you don't become the lost lieutenant like me. Uh, you know, we're, we're bringing you to the range so you can shoot straight. You know, the hard part was dealing with college administrations. And that, and so, you know, one of the things I kind of hung my hat on uh, for my time there was, you know, during the Vietnam War, they rescinded all college credit for ROTC classes because they said, you're not, you're not a legitimate uh, degree providing college. So, you know, you, it doesn't count. Your classes don't really count. And so I, you know, I was like, that's unfair because these, you know, cadets are paying money for these credits and you're not giving them credit for these classes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we went up through their, you know, chain of command and basically bought them and got it rescinded, you know, got it, got it back to where they got credit for the, the classes, which is huge, you know, because I mean, it was it was a class a semester, you know. That's three credits each semester that they weren't getting credit for, and uh, yeah. So that, that was what I was most proud of, you know, is like rescinding a Vietnam era, you know, old outdated policy that the school had, and it was just because they didn't like, you know, the policies in Vietnam at the time. Well, you know, this is, you know, I was there in 2007. Okay, hello. It's been a few days since then. <laughs> so, yeah. So, tell me about some of your stars. Did you? Did, was there somebody that you, you know, you told me about a famous, famous person that we graduated in OBC with? Yeah. Or there's somebody you taught that you know you're really, really proud of. You know, um, the, the the thing that I, that uh, is really great is, and I didn't know at the time. Um, you know these these cadets they there's not any one they're all heroes to me because they came in at a time that was very difficult um, during you know Iraq I mean number one to to volunteer to serve during that period um, when they know when they commission they're going to deploy they're going to Iraq or Afghanistan that takes a that's a strong committed person. And um, so, you know, they're, they're all, in my book, they're all heroes. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're all superstars too. You know, I had, you know, one class I had one year, there were, I believe there were four Rangers, uh, went to Ranger school and, and passed. And out of a commissioning class of like 12. So that's a pretty high percentage. And these were all high speed guys, you know, that were, you know, they, they they did ranger challenge you know they they were physically just you know the specimen of 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 uh, you know what a soldier should be so yeah it was, it, you know that's proud to have it's kind of funny so i i volunteer at the the national museum of the united states army uh it's right at fort belvoir it just opened up and i actually volunteered on saturday and it's only like a three hour shift but i had one of my cadets come up to me. Uh, I hadn't seen this guy since 2010 or 2009. Um, and he came, he was walking toward me. I'm like, okay, I recognize this guy. I, I couldn't pin, I couldn't pinpoint it right away. And he goes, Hey, sir, remember me? And I was like, okay, I know, I, I know, I know you from Temple University. And he's like, yeah, that's right. I'm cadet, you know, fam, or now captain fam, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's like, you know, just sharing stories from that moment on. It's like, you know, as soldiers do, once you see each other, it's like a day hasn't passed. You know, you just start sharing 
sharing stories about what's gone on since then. And yeah, so, and that happens all the time. Like I get, you know, our, during our time, OBC, you know how many lieutenants went through at that time? I mean, hundreds, right? And I mean, I'll be walking around, you know, at a Walmart and, and somebody will come up to me and go, hey, sir, you remember me? I was Lieutenant so-and-so in class with so-and-so in LBC. I don't remember. <laughs> I mean, there were so many of them. I'm like, oh, geez, did, you know, did I call you in my office and chew you out at some point? <laughs> and they're like, no, no, <laughs> it's all good. But uh, yeah, so they, they, but they remember you, you know, they remember usually, you know, as soldiers remember their, always remember their drill sergeant, you know, lieutenants remember their OVC, you know, SGI or, or NCO. Or, yeah, yeah. Our, our classes are making uh, battalion command right now. That's crazy to think. Right, yeah. Right. So our <laughs> lieutenants. Uh, have just got out of and are just going into and are in the next group to be, you know, b battalion commanders. And I'm, I, it's uh, so cool. Isn't it? it? Right? Yeah. Of course, it makes me feel old, you know, you get the grade, you're like, oh. That's part of it. That's part of it. You know? Yeah, I, that's all. Hey, I, I hope that I can be old Yoda one day, right? <laughs> that's cool, right. That's okay. right. That's It'd be right. okay to be old, you know. It'd be like, you know. Yeah. Um, wise man. Yes, wise man. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So, all right. So, if you had to go back and relive one year again or one deployment again, what 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 would it be? You know. What oh, man, that's a tough one. You know. God. I. Yeah, that's tough. I would. I would probably. <laughs> Uh, it would be my lieutenant years again. Yeah, it would definitely be my lieutenant years because that was so screwed up. <laughs> you got a chance to redo it? You I would like better. to redo those years, you know, <laughs> and, and prove that I wasn't such a screw up. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. But one of the issues with being a lieutenant is you have the leeway to mess so much yeah, up. Yeah. That is because exactly I'm gonna tell you, right. if you don't have a sergeant that's got your back, yeah. he can let you go for all. Oh, he, OTF out there flapping. Yeah. Yep, he'll let you OTF. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was like, I always like uh, was my was the advocate for for my squad leaders and and my NCOs. You know, I was like, even if they didn't think they should have. <laughs> And that's one thing that my battery commander always said is, man, you're always standing up for your guys, you know, even when they were, it was questionable whether I should have. I always stood up for them, you know, because I knew they got my back. <laughs> I got to get them back. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's, uh, look, our loyalties are, they're just ingrained in the sand that we do PT in every morning, right? Yeah. When you're out there with your soldiers, they it just it just all works together. Yeah, so hardship right. breeds camaraderie and you know loyalty. Yeah. Did you ever get hazed? Oh man! So the worst hazing I had was at Airborne School, believe it or not. And so this was '89. And uh, so I was in the barracks, you know, Cadet Riley, and um, all of a sudden I remember I was wrapped up in one of those wool blankets, and they were doing, they were pulling me through the, through the hallway there, back and forth like a sled. I was wrapped up so tight I couldn't move, and they were just having relays with me, back and forth, <laughs> and I was like, man, this sucks. <laughs> But I mean, you know, you're a cadet. You got no, you know, you're not, you're not an officer. You're, you you are not even really acknowledged as anything as a cadet. You know, you're just like, what is this guy doing here? Why does he get to go to airborne school? You know, so the NCO has just had a ball with us, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but it was fun. I mean, you know, it was all in good, good jest, you know, they weren't malicious about it. They didn't hurt me. It was just. It was their fun, you know. They're having fun. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, tell me about your your patriotism. How does it come out? Are you a July the Fourth fireworks kind of guy? Or, you oh, know, man, tell me about that. 
I, you know, I'm just, uh, I, I'm a red blooded American, you know, I, I just love, I love everything about it. I love, um, you know, I love, yeah, I love 4th of July. I love fireworks. Actually, this last firework, this last 4th of July, we went down to Myrtle Beach. And I thought I was, I thought it was at a live fire range because we were right on the beach. And it, I don't know, people, it seemed to me they spent their life savings on fireworks. <laughs> And they were all like 10 feet away from us. And it was just going up all over. I was like, wow, this is impressive. But um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I mean, I have a flag hanging out in front of my house. You know, I have uh, vanity plates that say veteran. I, you know, I, I'm all in, man. Amen. This is the best place to be. It's not perfect, you know, but this, you know, being in the army, that's that's what gives us a different perspective. I, I've been to places that it ain't so great. I never want to go back to Saudi Arabia again. I've been there so many times. I, I, I don't care if that place drops off into the sea. I don't ever want to go back there. <laughs> I've been to, you know, I've been to Sri Lanka. I, there's nothing redeeming about Sri Lanka. And so like that gives me an appreciation of where I am right now. I mean, I love being able to walk into a grocery store and have like 50 choices of what kind of cereal I want to buy. I mean, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I go crazy for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> what, what, um, <clears throat> do you have like, do you have any advice for like those that come after you for military service? You know that do you do you suggest military service for those that that might follow in your footsteps one day? Yeah, it, I mean it's I do, but you know, it, and it's harder and harder these days, um, given you know the population just ninety nine percent of them aren't even qualified to serve because they've got health issues or they've got, uh, you know, just whatever, they, they, they're not qualified to serve. Um, that was one of the big challenges I had when I was uh, in ROTC is, you know, they have a great kid motivated, wanted to be an officer and, you know, they had some medical condition they couldn't serve or they had, you know, back when they were a kid, they were on, um, you know, drugs for, for whatever, ADD or, or, you know, whatever you couldn't, you could not bring them in. Um, so that's why I think it's so critical. In these, you know, these days, if, if you know, I, I did not recommend my daughters join um, because I know my daughters and I knew they wouldn't be a good fit uh, for them to serve in the military. Um, but I definitely do recommend parents to sit down with their kids and say, hey, this is a viable option for you, and it's a good option, and you're gonna, it's gonna make you better. Um, but I know a lot of people don't don't do that. You know, they're very afraid of their kids serving in any of the military services. I had that happen to me all the time. Like, kids would come to campus, and parents would be like, hey, I don't want my kid dying in in Iraq or Afghanistan. I was like, nobody wants to die in Iraq, <laughs> and you know, that's, that's not what we train people to do. You know, we train them to be good people, good leaders, um, you know, and, and be competent and have character. Is that what you want your you know, son or daughter to have? Is that qualities that you think are honorable? And, you know, typically we'll work it through that way, but, you know, it's it's hard to rash you know to dialogue with somebody where like, I don't want my kid to die. Uh, <laughs> I don't want my kid to die either. <laughs> you know, let's get that straight right off the bat. You know, nobody wants their children to die. So, but do you want them to be good people? You know, do you want them to be successful? Um, that that's what you really focus on. Yeah. So that would be my advice. Is you know talk. Um, you know, even though we're retired, we still have an obligation, I think, to talk uh, you know, positively about our experiences in the Army and pass that on. And, you know, you know that, 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 that's what got passed on to me by my dad and my granddad. And, and um, you know, I'll never speak badly about 
you know, yeah, there's bad things that happen in the military, but on the large, large scale, there are so many positive things, much more than, than the negative things. Yeah. One of the things that I enjoyed so much about the military was that almost everything was written down ahead of time <laughs> for you to read. You had a manual for each piece of equipment. You had yeah. a doctrine of people that had decided to do it ahead of time. And, yeah, it was easy to get lost individually or with your platoon, but that was also things that you just had to control on your own. The rest of the stuff, it was like, you know, you know, march order drill, march order. And yeah. Everybody ran around and did their thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's a path, right? You know the path. And it's well known. You, you like, you go here, you do this, you do this, you do this. That's laid out for years. I mean, you can enter and somebody can sit you down and say, okay, you're going to be a platoon leader. You're going to go to you know, advanced course, then you're going to go do your battery command, then you're going to go to course again, then you're going to, they can lay out, you, what job have you ever been in that can do that? Like, I can't do that now. I'm in a job where I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing in a year from now, you know? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, you're right, it's laid down, it's on paper. To be successful, do this. And yeah, there's some gray areas. And there's, you know, but but overall, you pretty much know. Yeah. Don't date the general's daughter. Don't date the <laughs> you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the big one was, you know, don't drink and drive. Duh. That, was a big one. that, was <laughs> that a took big a lot of leaders one. down, you know. That took a lot of good people down, just doing stupid stuff. Um, but. <laughs> So were you a good shot? Were you good at shooting your weapon? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I was good. I wasn't an expert. Uh, I, I was good with a pistol. Yeah, I mean, I, I usually shot expert with a pistol, but uh, the M16 at the time, I wasn't very good. Um, I'm a lefty. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, That's so crazy thing. Um, I'm right-handed, but left eye dom dominant. So, and I, I always hated that like with the M16, because the brass would be shooting in my face and stuff. And I, I, I yeah, but it wasn't very good with the M16, but, but, you know, pistol I was pretty good with. And I usually could fire expert with that. But yeah, I, I mean, as an officer, you really don't, you don't get to do, you know, you run ranges as an, as a, as an officer, which isn't fun at all. One of the best ranges I ever went to was the Vulcan range. And, uh, you know, the Vulcan was a great weapon, you know. I mean, you, you, you were a Vulcan guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, you were a Vulcan yeah, guy. I'm so, a Vulcan you know, you remember the bats. They had the shroud that they pulled behind it, you know, and they had, um, so this range was, was, you know, I was a platoon leader at, and my platoon was firing, and, you know, everybody's super, super excited. You know, you don't get to do it very often. And so what I remember is, you know, the bat comes by and it's this jet and then all of a sudden, whirr, 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 whirr. and all of a sudden I hear this over the intercom, I hear three. I'm like, what, what, what are they calling out? What's that number? He's like, that's how many hits there were. It was like, you're firing thousands of rounds and you hit the shroud three times. I was like, oh man. That's why we're throwing so many rounds down range. It was like, oh, not a very accurate weapon. It was but, a, 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 a spray and pray. Yeah, spray and pray. And you never use the radar. It was always Kentucky windage. <laughs> it was like, you know, a good gunner just used, you know, the optical, Manual didn't use the radar. Manual mode, no radar, because you knew we were going to be jammed anyway, okay? That's the first thing. Oh, yeah. If you radiate, it, everything's going to jam you. Anyway, it, yeah, it was all manual mode. Yeah. And there were some of us that got pretty good at it, but the problem was you couldn't get good at it officially, right? Because you had mm. to do the right thing yeah, officially. You, yeah, you're supposed uh, to do it by the book. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Especially later when the PIVADs came, okay? Uh. It would track on its own and all that stuff. But it was uh, all, all of us knew it was crap. It wasn't helping at all because we'd get jammed. 
<laughs> whatever, you know, whatever. But you were towed Vulcan, right? I was a towed Vulcan. You were towed, so I was SP. Drag, but I was SP at, in in Korea. I did a tour on on an SP right. Vulcan. So you know, you know the deal with SP then. I know about it. And so you know, as a platoon leader trying to keep up with Bradleys and tanks, it, <laughs> I was the most professionally embarrassed when we were doing a train up for NTC, and we were doing lanes. And so it was probably like a three kilometer long lane where they were practicing their formations and I was supposed to support them. So, you know, they would, they would start off and they'd be moving and, and deploying and I was trying to keep up with them. They were, they were gone. They, they left me in the dust. They had already repositioned, turn around and were coming back for the next, you know, iteration of their maneuvers. And I was still trying to finish that first one. I was like, this is horrifying. I was so, uh, it, it was so embarrassing. So I finally told the, uh, the captain, I was like, hey, I'm just going to position off the side and provide protection <laughs> while you go back and forth. <laughs> That's what I do anyway. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, okay. You're just getting in our way. <laughs> I was like, man, this is so unprofessionally. It was all oh, horrible. <laughs> We did that in Korea, right? We're driving down this dry creek bed or river bed in Korea. The Bradleys and tanks, Abrams are just doing 45, 50 miles an hour through there like nothing. And we're like 15 miles an hour. <laughs> and then it would blow a transmission. You'd be stuck. And, oh. <laughs> yeah. It was horrible. And it was cold in Korea, <laughs> really cold. <laughs> really cold, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Rough times, man. But you oh. learn from it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is so fun. Thank you so much for visiting and, and hanging out and telling a few stories, you know? Yeah, this is, like I said, Will, this is this is great what you guys are doing. And um, I envy your position, you know, to be able to talk to, uh, you know, soldiers like, uh, and just chew the fat with them, you know? And it's, it's so awesome and uh, really admirable what you're doing. Well, thank you. I, I look, I'm having the time of my life. I'm honestly, I have over a hundred and something people on. The I don't know how, man. I, I don't. You don't have the time. Working. It's hard. I know. It's this is like a you're volunteering. You know, this is volunteer work, and it's so like I said, it's so honorable what you're doing. You're you're taking time out of your own schedule to do this. It's it's awesome. Well. I appreciate you spending a few minutes with me and telling a story or two. And I, so this is for your kids and your grandkids. Okay, yeah. this is for when this is for when your grandkid is is older and says, "Hey, let me show you my badass granddad." Right? <laughs> right? Yeah, he yeah. got lost in the war. Uh-huh. Yeah, maybe you can delete that section, right? No, no, that's we're leading with that. That's the headline right there. <laughs> But the key thing is the reality of it, right? We're yeah. just out there trying to do what we were doing. Yeah. You just demonstrated and said there was no way you could keep up with them anyway, right? No. <laughs> you were just what this dust cloud or that dust cloud? They kind of merged. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was <laughs> horrible. This is before we had the old sluggers and the pluggers. Oh, that didn't work. Yeah, they didn't catch. I mean, you couldn't get any satellite, co- you know, coverage with any of them. And yeah, yeah, that's. It was, it's all good, man. You know, you survive it and you learn from it, you know? So, so one of the things I'd love it, if you, if you could do, sir, is call your unit to attention and then sign out. I uh, surely can. That would be yeah. awesome. That doesn't mean that we had to enter in the interview, but that's part of, part of, you know, what I, I would love to get on tape that I think there's a lot of value in that. I just, I just really love it. Okay. Well, yeah, I could so sign out and just give a yeah, you know, like like you know, uh, I don't know, but battery. <laughs> you know, officers, we don't do that stuff. Oh, that's right. you don't call, you don't call folks. Yeah, you call. Yeah, so, well, we just call attention and hey, first sergeant. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, just to call you to attention and say first sergeant take charge or something like that. Exactly. <laughs> you know the deal. Yeah. No, I could definitely do that. Okay. So I just call them to attention and uh, give my farewell. Huh? <laughs> All right. I don't know what, what size unit should I, I know. Platoon!
Attention! First Sergeant, take charge of the troops. I love it, sir. That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, you know we don't do drilling ceremonies at all. <laughs> we don't know that. <laughs> See you at the German club, sir. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good, man. Oh. oh, my gosh. Sir, thank you so much. I enjoyed it. It's been a blast. It's yeah, been a blast. it's great catching up with you, Will. I love it. I love it. Gather up a few pictures and send them to that email. So I, I think I did. Yeah, I sent them a couple of days ago. You okay. should have them. Okay, good. Perfect. Yeah. Yay. I love you, sir. All right, man. Well, God bless.